um, welcome everybody to uh, the uh, session 19 of DCMI 2022, uh, which is the community updates. Uh, I'm Alistair MacDonald from the University of Edinburgh, where I'm the Metadata and University Collections Facility Manager, and I'm also the uh, current chair of the DCMI Governing Board. Um, so what our session uh, today will consist of is a series of short presentations from DCMI institutional members and working groups. Um, this follows on from the 2021 Members Forum, which showcased the work of our institutional regional members. Uh, we have presenters from East Asia, the Americas and Europe, reflecting the international nature of the DCMI community. We'll have six short presentations in this session, which will last 90 minutes. And it's also an open session, so it's uh, not just open to conference delegates and all can, um, can attend. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have all the presentations and then general questions at the end. So if you have any questions that occur to you uh, during a presentation, please put them in the chat along with who you would like them addressed to. Or at the end of the presentations, just uh, raise your hand if you'd like to speak and uh, ask a question. So as I say, we'll have six uh, presentations. And it's uh, again, it's reflecting the work of the institutions and the working groups, the CMI. So our first uh, presentation, uh, this is pre-recorded uh, as Yuha is unable to make it, uh, is uh, on the progress by the work of the Scholarly Resources Application Profile. Uh, Yuha Hakala is a senior advisor at the National Library of Finland, where he has over 20 years experience in standards related work. His involvement with DCMI began at the second Dublin Core Conference in 1996. Yuha co-chairs the, uh, the DCMI Scholarly Resources Application Profile Working Group with his cos colleague Osma Sumanen, who's a member of the DCMI Governing Board. And uh, as I say, his presentation will today be recorded. So um, if, uh, if Sally can now play that. Um, hello everyone, I'm Juha Hakala, a senior advisor in the National Library of Finland. It's my pleasure to uh, tell you a little bit about the uh, Scholar Resources application profile. And let me start a presentation. Um, the aim of the working group is to improve uh, doubling core metadata terms by adding um, <clears throat> terms with which to describe uh, scholarly resources, with which we mean. Uh, things like doctoral dissertations, master's thesis, uh, scientific articles, etc. Um, these kind of resources are already described uh, using Dublin Core, but uh, universities and other research institutions need uh, non-standard extensions to the metadata terms to do this. And these extensions uh, reduce semantic interoperability uh, and make a, a metadata exchange and interpretation more complicated. And also maintaining these extensions requires duplicate effort. This working group was established back in 2021 by DC governing board. And uh, the decision of the board was based on a proposal made by the National Library of Finland. And we used uh, two existing specifications, uh, from, one from Yukon 
United Kingdom Office of Library Networking and then another one from the National Library of Finland to write the proposal. The Finnish uh, guidelines document is unfortunately only available in Finnish. Uh, my colleague Osma Suomen and, and myself are co-chairs of this working group that has a fairly extensive website uh, in GitHub containing uh, the latest profile draft uh, meeting minutes and uh, documentation about the issues that we have uh, discussed. Uh, we have had uh, 17 meetings so far, and we have discussed a very diverse uh, set of uh, problems like how to express affiliations, <clears throat> how to express contributors and their roles, and so on and so forth. We have made some uh, generic decisions uh, concerning the profile. One is that uh, some of the metadata terms that we uh, create uh, will be generic uh, for the CMI metadata terms. And the uh, date lost is an example of this. And then some other terms are specific to a SRAP application profile, like a date available as public draft. We also need to alter semantics of some DCMI terms. Um, and access rights is an example of this because we have to specify uh, access rights uh, in the context of uh, repositories. We also need uh, syntactical devices which haven't existed in the past. Uh, like uh, how do we uh, connect uh, creators with uh, affiliations in various uh, Dublin core syntaxes. Date is an interesting area in for scholar resources because it is often important to clarify when a certain research finding was first published and in which form. So we have uh, decided to uh, propose date lost and date missing in order to make room for tombstones of uh, publications that have been retracted or which have for some other reason gone missing. But then we also have plenty of dates to cover different stages of a publication process from date available as public draft to a date update. Uh, roles, we need to specify a lot of roles for various kind of contributors and also to decide whether certain agents are contributors or something more fundamental. And we have decided to uh, propose the usage of Library of Congress related terms as um, SAP roles. And many of these are sub properties of contributor, but not all of them. The initial version of the dry SRAP uh, profile uh, included just four um, uh, roles for contributors it was wise for editor, funder, and opponent. But we believe that many more of these roles will be added in. in working group meetings in the future. Also, if we come up with something that is not included in the Library of Congress list uh, so far, we, we have decided that uh, we will just add um, a send a request to the Library of Congress that it should be added to the list. Uh, some examples of uh, other terms that we are proposing embargo uh, that will be 
that we have specified in the form of embargo date range. And the range uh, must have an end date. Uh, publication status. Uh, we have decided to use a public draft, preprint, uh, postprint, uh, submitted manuscript publication, and updated publication. Um, so this enables us to use uh, publication status as a means of telling apart the different variants of the same uh, resource. Affiliation is, is complicated because full coverage of persons' affiliation can only be provided in authority record. And in SRAP context, we decided to just uh, provide the creator's affiliation or affiliations at the time the described resource was created. We still have a lot of work to do, and um, uh, there are challenges involving semantics, uh, what uh, kind of metadata should be provided, and syntax, uh, how to express this uh, metadata in a machine-readable form. The process, once we have uh, completed the profile is that the DCMI usage board will decide uh, which terms, which proposed terms will be included in DCMI metadata terms. And uh, once uh, DCMI has done the work, uh, then uh, ISO will take over and um, these uh, new terms and other changes will be introduced into the ISO version of Dublin Core as well. But of course, all of this will only be useful if uh, SRAP uh, metadata terms are implemented in Dublin Core applications, both for cataloging and searching. And uh, customers will be important at this stage. Thank you for your interest in this presentation. I will be, I may not be available for questions because timing of this session is a bit inconvenient for me. It's uh, 11 o'clock in the evening in Finland. Uh, for uh, thanks to you Hart, for providing us with the um, video. Uh, as a member of the Scholarly Resources Application uh, Profile Working Group, I would be happy to take questions from uh, anyone about that. And uh, anything that I can't answer, I will, of course, uh, refer to either uh, Karen Coyle or Tom Baker, who are also members of the working group. Um, so our second presentation this evening is an institutional uh, showcase and um, Frederick Klingwall uh, has the role of developer at the National Library of Sweden with a focus on ontologies and information modeling. The National Library of Sweden is the newest DCMI member and Frederick has sat on the DCMI governing board since February of this year. So Frederick. Thank you, Alistair. Um, thank you for this invitation. Uh, I'm just going to share the screen. We have... This presentation uh, is called uh, From Machine Readable to Machine Reasoning. It kind of is a showcase, as you said, of the information transmutation at the National Library. And this is our first DCMI community update, which is very nice. We became the institutional member uh, in February this year. And except for me in the government board, we're also represented by Stina Degestet, the metadata strategist. She is the alternative representative. And Niklas Lindström uh, is in the usage board. And he was in a panel yesterday talking about bib frame, which some of you might have heard. 
And uh, to go back to the Royal Library, which is called the uh, Kungliga Biblioteket in Sweden, I will refer to it as KB. Uh, it's the National Library, but it actually derived from uh, the King's private collection. And uh, our collections today uh, is kind of because of the legal deposit law from 1661, uh, which of course then was not, uh, it was more of an instrument of censorship to, to be able to see what was printed in the kingdom, but it actually helped us preserve a lot of Sweden's cultural heritage. And, and this law in the modern day became more expanded to, into sounds, moving images, uh, and through a merge with a, another archive for the sound and image uh, and the, the extension of the law for legal deposit, we have a, quite a big collection of different materials. Another one of KB's tasks is to promote development and collaboration within the Swedish library sector, which means we have a Swedish union catalog, Libris, uh, which contains about 14 million titles, books, newspapers, magazines, and audiovisual material. And it has the holdings of 45 million from about 600 Swedish libraries. And this is kind of where I will put the focus today. However, I need to go back to the initial idea and concept of why are we describing things. And uh, the purpose is usually in our context to locate or make sense of something we want to find or use. And uh, a perspective of that can be found in Umberto Eco's quote of how we as humans make sense of uh, the incomprehensible, so to speak. Um, and that is true list and catalogs. Uh, and this quote kind of reflects on how items are, in a sense, very physical. And, and when we think about catalogs, I think a lot of people still has this image in their minds. But how, the catalog itself is actually a technological iteration of what came before. Um, the core is the same, but we usually, uh, the technology in which we describe things as bibliographic items uh, became formalized in a sense of, for the purpose of finding things. And uh, most of them uh, in the metadata concerns three things, which is the need for efficiency in both production and use. because. We all have bigger volumes of data, the content and media become more diversified and harder to describe, and the structure and relationships to other things become also more important. So in the 60s, um, Mark became a revolution in the library world, as I think a lot of you know. Um, it was through pure collaboration, uh, efficiency, ideas to do less double work and be able to share uh, cataloging cards. Um, it was for the purpose of printing them still. So the electronic um, databases were still to come. But this kind of, in Sweden, it uh, kind of put to flame an idea of uh, an integrated library system. Uh, and in 1972, it, the first iteration of Libris was released and the technological hurdles from the start uh, was pretty big and I should not go into those here. Um, but as, um, as we move forward um, to what Libris is, it, it's, the idea is still the core of doing one cataloging of a book and let that come to the collective use. And in, after several uh, iterations, the Libris transition to Mark in 2002, and all the critique against Mark was already brewing by that time, the new system enabled bigger volumes of metadata, improved record reuse with an international standard and global connectedness, and development of a lot of products by Libris around the core catalog especially easy ways to access and transform records, which is kind of crucial for what is to come. Uh, five years later, a new libris.kb.se is uh, presented. Uh, it's a modern, at the time, uh, web uh, interface to search. It was developed 
by libraries um, with using persistent HTTP URIs and lightweight APIs. And this kind of sets the stage for the next evolution, which is Libris as linked data. 2008, uh, Libris is published as the first catalog, library catalog, that was published in as linked data in its entirety, uh, with a basic bibliographic records using ontologies like DC, SCOS, and FOAF. But these are very basic records. Um, however, they do kind of show the proof of concept of linking things together. And Martin Malmsten uh, did a presentation of this, uh, actually at DC 2008 in Berlin, making a library catalog part of the semantic web. And uh, in 2009, the linked open data cloud, which showed which services there are using linked data, you can see that there's a little seed here for interoperability uh, within the internet. Uh, a few years later, we are actually here, over 1,500 data sets connected, so it's kind of hard to overview, but it, it kind of shows the promise of having building blocks being able to link to each other. And uh, as we can state, links are relationships, and uh, we are still in our core system using MARC. And, uh, Karen Coyle kind of succinctly pushes the idea that if you want to use entities and relations, we have to have something else than Mark 21 at the core. So the needs of a new system is kind of familiar by this time. Uh, we need to more efficiently describe diverse media with a structured data model. We need to handle larger volumes of data, both manually and automatically. And we now also like to connect to the web and use data from other sources and contexts outside the library. But our experiences with the libris.kobe.se service kind of says that there was a demand for simple APIs and the, rather not to use the library specific techniques like Mark 21 and Zeta 3950, which is kind of complicated. So Libris Excel uh, becomes the new cataloging system which uh, the development starts in 2012 and we go into production in 2018. So it was kind of a long development phase, but uh, the entire Libris catalog was converted from Mark 21 to RDF based on a build frame two vocabulary and still using extensions of SCOS, DC and schema and so on. All the while we're still being able to consume and produce Mark 21 because Almost all systems surrounding the ecosystems are still dependent upon this format. And another key component in uh, the Libris uh, movement is the KBV application vocabulary, which is that id.kb.se vocab service, which uh, provide us with uh, extensions and mappings to other um, uh, ontologies, and also the, being able to uh, use our own Swedish labels and definitions translated directly in the uh, vocabulary. And uh, the method of the policy at Kobe is to strive as much as we can to use linked data as the method in all handling, storing, and provisioning of metadata. So, uh, except for Libris and Kobe SC, we also have now have Svepub, the Swedish research publications and bibliometric analysis using BibFrame. And data.se, uh, which is handling digital object and data sets, is using extensions of DCAT, for example. And we're still looking at how this fits into the general picture. Um, we still have the digital archive and the audiovisual archive, which data.kobe.se can be the sort of uh, front page four, but we're still also um, very much trying to find our ways in how we should either link, cache, copy, and transform data with other sources. And, and this is one of the most challenging aspects today, because realizing possibilities is certainly a process. Uh, and all, all the while, the enhanced possibilities that we can see, uh, they, Sure, take time using 
linked vocabularies and entities in production pipelines are not uh, all in place yet. Um, the amount of duplicated work also lessens with linking, but still we need to use learn to use these possibilities. And uh, to connect to the rest of the world to share data, we need to have our entities in order. We also do have, looking back to the collections, which are now in a digital form, um, much of them. And this means that we have the ability to form KB Lab. The idea of a lab, the library is not new. Uh, LC has one and it's very inspiring. But it also, this enables researchers to engage in large scale analysis of KB's collections and test and explore the potential for artificial intelligence to be used within the library. And uh, NLP needs big amounts of data that we got. So a lot of the digital material is not available to the general public, but becomes useful to generally trained language and acoustic models. And uh, we use this to explore uh, some of the activities that we're doing now in the lab is automated linked subject system creation expressed as link open data uh, based not on actual words or terms, uh, but only based on content similarity. Extracting entities and frequent keywords from articles in a legal deposit of electronic material. Uh, large scale image and audio analysis, uh, which could result in quite a huge amount of extracted information, uh, since we have millions of hours of speech. Also crowdsourcing corrections for predicted annotations. And uh, what we see as challenges here is data is always messy and uh, simplification is not easy. Uh, we saw the, the, the simple uh, first Libris um, RDF was kind of way too simple and now we're still working on trying to simplify and figure out what it is we need going forward. And also a big part is normalization by linking strings and codes and disambiguating. So we don't have just a string saying it's paper in a uh, unknown language, but we can link to an actual definition with, to, to a material for paper and uh, have links to other things. So working with all this, uh, sometimes it feels like pure alchemy to work with metadata and the transformation thereof. So I'd like to call that alchemy metadata, but still, uh, what we also find is that benefit arises in usage. So getting things out there is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederick. That's um, really a wonderful presentation. Seeing so much that was, uh, you know, ahead of the curve and forward thinking from collecting computer games uh, via legal deposit to uh, even publishing your brief linked uh, data record sets. So that's that's fantastic. Thank you. So we'll um, move on now to our next presenter, which is um, again a an institutional. Um, showcase and it's from Hai Jin Kim at the National Library of Korea and Hai Jin uh, has worked since 2001 having responsibility uh, for so 2021 uh, at the National Library of Korea and she's had responsibility for bibliographic standards at the metadata and sustainable access division. She's currently working to align the Korean mark formats core mark with mark 21 and has an interest in the transition from mark to link data-based bibliographic frameworks. And uh, again, her, pre uh, her presentation today is pre-recorded. Hello, I'm Hazin Kim. I'm a librarian who is working in Metadata and Sustainable Access Division of the National Library of Korea. For your information, I'm going to shorten National Library of Korea as NLK in this presentation. Today, I'd like to share NLK's activities on a new bibliographic data environment. This is a brief introduction of myself.
Now you can see the contents of this presentation. I'll introduce an overview of NRK's long-term plan titled as National Bibliography 2030. Then I'll share currently working project under the plan. Let's start with an introduction to what National Bibliography 2030 is. This plan is to transform the current market-centric bibliographic structure into a new structure suitable for linked data environment by 2030. The plan was announced in July 2021 by Metadata and Sustainable Access Division, and it has three main purposes. One, development of Korean bibliographic data appropriate for web and linked data environment. Two, flexible acceptance of new type of resources. Three, enhancement of mutual reusability between data inside and outside the library. The plan is divided into three stages, which are groundwork, introduction, and implementation. Each stage will take three years. Actually, the first stage started last year. I'll explain each step in more detail. In the first stage, groundwork, we will adjust the basic standardization system for the transition to the next bibliographic data structure. We are going to update two kinds of Korean mark, which is co-mark for bibliographic data and authority data. And we will plan and arrange several projects to accept the B-frame. We will expand the scope and scale of authority data, including uniform titles. Also, we will advance Korean National Bibliography Services for data sharing and utilization. After that, we are going to move to the next stage. Introduction stage is to create the foundation and enrich bibliographic data. We will revise NLK's cataloging guidelines by applying the Korean cataloging rules, which will be revised in 2024. Then we will convert the legacy data to data that complies with new KCR5. And we will create mapping rules for conversion between different bibliographic languages, such as comma to be frame, moves to be frame. And we will expand linked data driven vocabularies in bibliographic data. We will form a working group with domestic libraries and related institutions. The last step is the implementation stage. We will try to convert sample language data into B-frame data in order to establish detailed conversion plan. And if the plan is ready, all legacy mark data will be converted to B-frame data in honest. Tools for B-frame conversion and editing will be developed in this stage. At the same time, we will design templates to create B-frame data by type of resources. We will also establish a plan 
to reorganize and optimize the library systems for new data structure. From now on, I'll share with you about the main project in progress at NLK under the National Bibliography 2013. NLK is updating Comark. Comark is the dominant bibliographic language used to create data in domestic libraries. Comark is a stable standard because it is established as a Korean national standard. However, due to of that, it is difficult to reflect update issues whenever necessary. So there are some gaps which Comark didn't fully apply international library standards like library reference model. So it is necessary to update Comark to ensure interoperability with international standards and to facilitate conversion into the next data structure. We started the project to update Comark from 2021. As a result of that, we made the drift last year. During that time, requirements are collected from domestic libraries through online public hearing and email, and so on. From this year, we are reviewing the draft from a practical point of view. For example, conflict with current encoding scheme and harmony with characteristics of Korean materials and re retroactive conversion of legacy data. We are expecting that the final version will be released in 2023. Another ongoing project is adaptation of B-Frame. Purpose of this project is to lay the foundation to apply B-Frame. In order to successfully introduce B-Frame, you must understand it and be able to use it. This year's project is making a view frame specification and a guide in Korean. This material will be helpful for everyone who wants to understand view frame. We started the project last June and now we have a draft. After having some time to review, we will open the final version to the public. Furthermore, we are going to give lectures for librarians to help understand B-Frame. So far, I briefly introduced NIK's activities on transition to a new bibliographic data structure. I really appreciate that I have an opportunity to give a presentation. I hope this presentation is useful for you. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, I was just on mute there. And thank you to Hi Jin uh, for uh, sending through her pre recorded presentation there. And uh, of course, you can direct any questions to Hi Jin uh, if you would like to ask anything about their uh, work. So, 
Um, we're now moving on to another report on um, one of the DCMI committees, uh, this time from uh, Marsha Zeng, and it's a report from the DCMI Education Committee. Uh, Marsha is a Professor of Information Science at Kent State University. Her research interests include knowledge organisation systems, linked data, semantic technologies and digital humanities. Uh, the author of over 100 research papers and six books, her research projects have received funding from organisations including OCLC, Fulbright and many others. She's chaired and served on a great many committees, working groups and executive boards and is a serving member of the DCMI Governing Board and the ISKO Board of Directors. So, Marsha. Thank you. I will share my screen here. Where's the... Hi, everyone. This is uh, Masha Zhen. I'm currently the chair of the DCMI Education Committee. This report will give a summary of the main activities and the products from the task group of the Education Committee during these two years. The Education Committee was initiated by Sam O and Tom Baker back to 2020. The committee was extended extremely late since last year, and now we have 26 members together. They represent various countries and regions in the world. The initial objective of the committee is to coordinate activities and publications that teach and inform users about current developments and technologies for metadata. The committee organizes webinars and tutorials and commissions blog posts for audiences ranging from newcomers to experts, including teachers of metadata in both academic and professional setting. During these two years, the committee members have been contributing to the DCMI conferences. You can see a lot of chairs and co-chairs, as well as the moderators. The student form started from 2021 and continuously this year. In addition to those listed here, many of them also contributed to recruit and recommend the best practices from their countries. There are eight task groups in this committee, members volunteers to become the leaders or participants of each task group. TG1 focuses on the blocks, creating blocks for metadata education purposes. TG2 write the summaries of key articles on metadata. TG3 reports on metadata standards and revisions. TG4 collaborating with webinars, prepare tutorials on new metadata applications. TG5 is a new one this year, focusing on any one field there's special interest and trends in the metadata. So, so far we have the metadata and AI as a special interest area. TG6 is on the DC usage in other models and TG7 
has our webmasters and advisors who together already made the TC, all the DC website uh, by the TG7. Romantically enhancement of the Dublin Core website. TG8 has been successfully organizing webinars and offers through DCMI and ACST. Just uh, this year, there are already four successful webinars and tutorials offered. And last year, there are five of them. A year ago back, has uh, one also in other languages. This is a future plan for having other languages in the webinars as well. Our TG4 focusing on the tutorials and through identify new release or updated tools, platforms, and the standards that would be interesting to DCMI community and the members. In addition to keep tracking of past tutorials from the community, they also review relevant tutorials from conferences, organizations, in the information science and work with the conference, coordinate with webinar task group and provide this kind of uh, webinar tutorials. They will also extend this to other languages. New platform, It's uh, created by the TG7 for blog posts, uh, white papers, and resource list. With this kind of workflow, this is a draft, education committee drafts. So members can publish drafts there and then approved by the TG chair and the committee chair, as well as the um, directory of the DCMI and decide whether this will be released on the Dublin Core website. Task Group 3 focuses on the metadata standards which have updates in the 2020s. So it's the newest place for anyone would like to find the new information. There are two major parts. One is new and the notable development. The second is the current standards which have been updated. In addition to the general purposes one, we have the metadata for cultural objects and visual resources. For research data, for archives preservation and provenance, and for publishing in the press communications. In addition to the element standards, we also upload the links related to the standardized schemes. The vocabularies can be used and the guidelines. The related updates, it's about the NCOS. This metadata standards updates actually is a part of the NCOS website. It's called Networked Knowledge Organization Systems Services Structures NCOS. Recently, it's moved from the my uh, can stay 
website to the uncus.doublingcore.org. The Incas interest group already had some activities and developed the Incas Dublin Core application profile and the KOS type vocabulary. This year, the Incas website moves to Dublin Core, formally announced. It document all the workshops initiated in back to the 1997 at ACM DL 97 workshop led by Joseph Bush. And the website has already more than 20 years. Um, so now it's officially part of the DCMI. Thank you so much, everyone for contributing to the metadata community of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Marcia. It's uh, really quite an amazing breadth and depth of areas that uh, the different tasks group cover. And I think really does show the truly international nature of the community when you saw how many different areas of the world the members of the different task groups came from. So our uh, next presentation uh, comes from Shigeo Sugimoto. And Shigeo is a professor emeritus at the University of Tsukuba. He has been involved in DCMI since the late 1990s and is a serving member of the DCMI governing board. His interests include metadata models for cultural and historical entities, such as intangible cultural heritage, media arts, and natural and man-made disasters. And his presentation today is on the work of the core cultural metadata model interest group of DCMI. Shigeo. Thank you, and good morning. Good afternoon, or good evening. Some of the in Japan, it's quite early in the morning. So they, let me start my presentation. All right, do you see the slide? Yes. All right. So yeah, I'll talk about the core cultural metadata <clears throat> model interest group. And um, so the uh, this is the background. So the in my understanding, the in a sense, the conventional or tradi traditional metadata schemes is quite item centric because it has been built as a catalog for the uh, memory institutions. And on the other hand, <clears throat> Uh, the recent development of the linked data or the linked open data and RDF uh, the, on the net, people are likely to access by content, but not by items. So this is one understanding of myself and also the cultural entities. So the from that the cultural entities point of view, so uh the many of the how say the digital collections of the cultural entities are created from the tangible object especially those <clears throat> built in the 1990s are how say created by digitization of the uh, holdings of the institutions but on the other hand we do have the many digital collections of intangible things, but uh, in a sense, those intangible uh, digital collections of intangible cultural heritage are created from the recordings. So in that sense, recordings, videos, or the films, they are a kind of the tangible object. 
And uh, I thought that uh, we need to think about what, how can we digitally archive intangible object? And also in Japan, I'm involved in the, say the Met media art database project, which is aimed to build um, metadata or the, in a sense of bibliographic records for comics, the Japanese manga, the Japanese comics and video games and animations and new media arts, which are rather oriented to content. So the users want to find content, but not items. So items are the, in a sense uh, set in the secondary position from the user's point of view. And like a Europeana, the linked open data has become a very important te technology and infrastructure for users to access cultural content. And a basic question is that, uh, do we have a well-defined basis to model cultural entities of various types? And um, the, my house starting point was um, metadata for intangible culture, heritage, and also the media art things. I wanted to discuss about the metadata schemes or the models for those new areas. Then let me show the slide. So there are quite various types of the intern, uh, cultural heritage. So first of all, in Japan, uh, the da perform dance performance in Thailand or paper making, uh, the fireworks and uh, animation, video game, and the um, well, now these are paintings and a big castle in Japan and a disaster. So these things, are collected in digital forms and we create digital how say the cultural digital archives. Okay, so how can we model them as a metadata? That is a basic question. So the uh, as I mentioned, the base model of conventional metadata standards and developed by the M uh, developed by the MLA, the memory institutions communities are primarily oriented to items because they have been developed for describing the items included in the, their institutional collections. So basic questions that um, base model of this would work for tangible object and their digital surrogates, however, Various digital cultural resources are curated and archived. So that, that the various digital objects that I mean, I showed in the previous slide. So we collect these are surrogates, but uh, some original object are too large, too big to move in into the <clears throat> memory institutions or ephemeral or just um, actions or something in as a intangible and um, users would want to find and access resources by their contents but not by their physical locations because for example the, when we think about the physical location of fireworks where is that it was it existed in the air for a very short time so to the convention standards and data models work well? That was my basic questions. And so here, this slide shows some comparison of the item-centric model and content-oriented model. So on the left, this is very, in a sense, it's a simple. Actually, I very much simplified. The, in the reality, the model is quite compl complicated. But here we have the originals and the, the digital surrogate and the metadata is created for this, in a sense, this combination. So on the, for example, the, uh, the museum libraries, memory institutions create their digital collections by digitizing the original ones to 
digital surrogate, and we could have some set of digital surrogates for the original one. And we usually access this digital surrogate. And the European, for example, collect metadata from the memory institutions and provide a portal to those digital collections. On the other hand, on the net, we do have various types of metadata. And um, users find some, how say, concepts, really, some, how say, conceptual entities. And then users find access paths to digital images and then use them. And in some case, those users would want to visit museums and see the real original object. But basically, on the, in, in our daily life, we use, I'll say, metadata available on the internet and use them as a primary entry point or access point to the cultural object. Okay, so I think that many people are living in this side and that sometimes Many people use the, how say, the metadata or the kind of databases provided by memory institutions. And uh, for example, in the case of the European, uh, these are well connected. Okay, then let me move on. So let me think about the entity types. So the in the conventional memory institutions, I think the main part of the collections is uh, are the tangible object. And uh, on the other hand, we do have quite a various types of the intangible cultural entities or events. So for example, the disasters, like uh, natural disasters or man-made disasters, and also ephemeral objects. So in those cases, we cannot collect the original things. Okay, so the uh, and we can, I can say something the, about the domains. So for example, the performing arts, as a, that could be, I'll say intangible cultural entities or some of the contemporary art, but um, there are several types, theater plays, dance, music, etc., and uh, new media art. So for example, the installations, those things could be understood, maybe understood as a performance or the compilation. So they are primary events and events, live performance, disasters, man-made or natural. So these things are how to be collected as the original form. So I like to mention about the experientials. So the, and also the objects. So objects means physical or digital objects and the perpetual object or the ephemeral object. So the, for example, the uh, museum is collections is a kind of uh, physical and perpetual object. But on the other hand, we do have to create various ephemeral objects and uh, we use recordings to collect ephemeral object. And also we have the static and dynamic and uh, there are the several types of the, uh, the object types and experiences. So the, my definition of the experientials is that the entities which we can experience, see, listen, touch, and anyways, what we can experience. So for example, the sports performance, that could be, we can see the sports performance. So in the sense that is the kind of experientials. So not all cultural entities can be collected as an original entity, but we can collect the digital service recordings of a live performance. So let me move on to, this slide, 
So the, this interest group is named Core Culture Metadata Model. And uh, at the workshop yesterday, we had some discussion about that name. And uh, so this slide shows my understanding or the, my definition. So uh, this is a pausing, the core, cultural metadata, and model. So the first one, core, because uh, we are working with this, this MI, so core is quite an important term. And the interoperability across domains and also the minimal set. So this is my understanding. The features common among and are applicable to various types of, of cultural entities. So in this sense, tangible, intangible, perpetual, ephemeral, or whatever. And cultural metadata. This is rather obvious. Metadata for cultural entities and model. So a set of abstract entities and the relationships among them, classes and their relationships which are defined to identify cultural entities, objects, events, actions, services, and so on. And model could be understood as an abstract system useful to identify cultural entities and the structures. So actually, this is my definition. And uh, at the perhaps a interest group, I would like to discuss about the meaning of the core culture metadata model. All right. So this is the uh, last slide. And um, so uh, actually I have to say that uh, the, this uh, CCMM interest group has been quite silent, uh, mainly because of, of my laziness. And uh, but um, in this DCMI conference, we had two panel sessions and one work session. So the session number five, so visual media arts and then session uh, number 17 chaired by moderated by Marsha and um, the topic was culture and linguistic challenges and we had a workshop yesterday and uh, myself and I'm asking Marsha to be a lead of the community and also the, I'd like to invite people who have interest in this group and also the who, who want to lead this group. And also, uh, <clears throat> the DCMI has given us <clears throat> the infrastructure, so email and GitHub. Okay, but uh, not very active yet, as I mentioned. And uh, I'd like to continue our discussion as interest group and uh, using the GitHub and the mailing list. And we welcome people to join CCMM interest group. So that's it. Thank you very much. I mean, that is a really fascinating way of looking things and it goes just so much far beyond simple ideas of who creators are or who published something. It's, it's really a fascinating uh, thing to, to look at. So our um, final presentation comes from uh, Tom Baker and uh, it is on the... Um, future directions of the DCMI Usage Board. Uh, Tom is the DCMI Technical Director and Usage Board, Board Chair, and he has worked on metadata and the semantic web since the 1990s. He helped publish SCOS in the early 2000s and currently contributes to the Shape Expressions language, Shex. He uh, consults widely on projects, most recently about data in agriculture, and he's worked as a researcher in Italy and Germany including the Fraunhofer Society and Gottingen State Library. Uh, Tom has a, an MLS from Rutgers University, an MA and PhD from Stanford. Uh, he's taught at the Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok, and Sung Yung Kwan University in Seoul. Tom. Do you see, do you see my slides? Yes, yes. Good. All right, so um, I'm going to start uh, this talk about future directions by um, um, looking, oops, why is this not working? Looking at the past. So um, how did this all start? Uh, it started in the early years, 1995, 1999, the workshop years, uh, you'd have 
50 to 150 people in a room at once. And at night, people would be huddled around their laptops. Um, and that's when the Dublin Core um, was created. In the beginning was the element. Uh, um, what, and the question was, what is an element? Is it like a mark field? Is it like an HTML element? Is it like an IAFA template attribute? Is it like an XML element? Um, if you uh, look carefully at this photo from Canberra in 1997, you'll see about half, of, half a dozen of the founders of the RDF working group at W3C. So on the margins already, this notion uh, that it could be an RDF property. So it was first published in 1998, the 15 elements without a particular data model. Um, Dublin Core qualifiers, the first major expansion of the vocabulary. There was an ad hoc usage committee of 26 members for about half a year or nine months. And uh, it added um, some qualifiers, element refinements and encoding schemes and uh, published uh, DCMI type vocabulary. Okay, but at the same time, um, uh, RDF was um, published as a W3C recommendation in 1999. And if you look at uh, one of the appendix, uh, appendix appendices of that um, uh, specification, uh, you'll see um, Dublin Core um, as an RDF vocabulary. The first RDF vocabulary developed outside of the World Wide Web Consortium. And in uh, 2001, we um, drew attention to the, um, uh, the importance of uh, URIs, uh, persistent URIs, um, and with the DCMI namespace policy, which says that um, meanings can, can evolve within defined limits. Um, if, um, if meanings evolve too far uh, and become new meanings, they require new URIs. And it was at the time, I think, innovative in its emphasis on URIs as persistent identifiers. So DCMI Usage Board was started in 2001, the, the, the current one. Um, it's always been about eight people, plus or minus. Um, and, um, and basically, over the course of the years, um, we um, um, we nudged the DCMI community in the direction of um, the RDF uh, data model, um, which was quite, I mean, it was quite controversial, um, I think, because, um, and I'll, um, I'll come to this in a second, because um, RDF was still had not established itself as a, it was seen as a, as kind of a pie in the sky research project, I think, by many people. And, um, but by 2008, um, uh, DCMI metadata terms were, were defined as an RDF vocabulary of properties and classes and data types. Um, so this is just, a few, I'm gonna run through these very quickly. These are a few slides from a presentation I gave last year um, at the conference about DCMI today. So um, Frederick was, had us, in the very nice slide of, um, of the library uh, card catalog and mentioned clay tab tablets, I believe as well. Um, but if we consider this metadata 1.0, so metadata on physical carriers, um, then metadata 2.0 um, was relational databases, online catalogs for libraries, spreadsheets, uh, XML in the 1990s, um, and what they had in, in common um, is that they were about machine readable data and fixed data structures, uh, but fundamentally designed with the assumption that they would be used in closed systems. Then metadata 3.0, um, so the idea of semantic web um, in 1999, the idea of linked open data in 2006, Knowledge Graphs, um, 2011, Wikidata, and, um, and uh, Knowledge Graphs and BibFrame, by the way, I believe that also started, uh, schema.org and BibFrame, I believe, um, uh, started around that time as well. Um, 
And the in metadata 3.0 is characterized by use of URIs as global identifiers um, and graph data structures and machine understandable um, semantics. So the status of, um, I think uh, now it's, um, it's, it's no longer controversial um, that um, DCMI metadata terms is an RDF vocabulary, um, but as we tried to explain, the usage board tried to explain um, in the um, ISO um, 15836 um, in, uh, published in uh, 2019, DCMI metadata terms are expressed in RDF vocabularies for use in linked data, but creators of non-RDF metadata, metadata can use the terms in contexts such as XML, JSON, UML, or relational databases um, by focusing on the natural language text of definitions, usage notes, and examples. Um, so um, we don't think that um, having the vocabulary based in RDF is an impediment to its use um, in, um, in metadata, in um, technologies of, um, of, of metadata 2.0. So um, the usage board has, um, has um, pursued a policy of what I call cautious expansion. Um, uh, the position of DCMI in the metadata ecosystem, I think, is um, to provide these uh, broadly applicable terms. Uh, we've made some exceptions to fill, uh, mostly to fill gaps in the application profiles, more specific properties. Um, but we've kept, we've kept the overall vocabulary small um, so that it is maintainable with limited resources and so that it is relatively coherent. Um, I wanted to call out uh, one um, uh, thing that we did uh, along the way um, announced in 2005. Uh, we collaborated uh, with uh, the Library of Congress to, um, um, uh, to, and the Library of Congress declared a selection of MARC um, relators as RDF properties and declared them to be sub properties of uh, DC contributor. Yuha uh, mentioned this in his talk earlier um, because they're, they're used in the uh, scholarly resource application profile. And um, it's interesting to note, this is an early use of RDF by Library of Congress, 2005. Um, I think uh, ID lock gov servers, I think that came online in, in 2010, if I'm not mistaken. So um, the usage board is uh, formally recognized by ISO as the maintenance agency for DCMI um, metadata terms. And um, it's uh, the first uh, NISO standard was published in 2001, first ISO standard in 2003, and um, it has been reviewed and, um, and recently in, in, in uh, uh, 2019, it was extended with um, DCMI properties and classes. And this will continue, um, the usage board will continue to serve in this, um, in this capacity. Uh, but meanwhile, in the broader DCMI community, I think it's important to realize that um, the, after um, 2001, uh, the attention of the DCMI community really turned um, it, it focused less on DCMI metadata terms per se. It was more about the notion of an application profile. So at conferences and working groups, there, were, there was a lot of work, a lot of discussion of, of, of the application profile. Um, and uh, there was also a focus uh, at DCMI conferences on other vocabularies that could be used in application profiles. So schema.org, uh, Wikidata, Bibframe, um, there have been uh, important tutorials, sessions and um, panels about, about all of these. Um, Dublin Core app, uh, DCMI style application profiles today um, define metadata schemas. They use RDF or RDF-ish uh, vocabularies. Um, they um, add constraints and 
the idea of the application profile um, fits um, um, some very important um, new RDF shape languages, uh, which I won't discuss, um, uh, such as uh, Shex and Shackle. Um, there is, I wanted to call out uh, one important to a work in progress, um, DC tabular application profiles. Um, that effort um, uh, is being led by Karen Coyle and um, Karen and uh, John Huck are going to um, give a, um, a tutorial about um, DC tabular application profiles um, tomorrow. So I recommend if you're interested and the, app, the tabular app application profile is, is, um, is uh, our attempt to, to make it easy for people to create application profiles and spreadsheets that can be then um, converted into machine uh, readable representations and, uh, and um, converted into um, uh, shape languages for use and validation and, and that sort of thing. Um, I also wanted to um, mention in this context the um, notion of application profile uh, patterns. Um, so the uh, DC TAP effort is also making a cookbook. Uh, it's um, also being led by, by Karen. Uh, and the idea is to help people make better profiles. Um, and it is about usage, but it's not currently within the scope of the usage board. So maybe it should be, that's something we um, uh, will um, we'll discuss. So uh, all of the things above uh, on um, the um, uh, maintenance of the DCMI metadata terms will continue as before. Uh, what other things, uh, what other activities uh, could the usage, is the usage board doing or could it, um, will it uh, be focusing on? One is the review of application profiles. And here we had um, Yuha's presentation um, earlier um, the, um, about the scholarly resources application profile. Um, there is a new process uh, whereby the usage board reviews propose proposals for new terms that come out of the, um, about, out of the profile development uh, process and um, is also then uh, approves its um, final publication um, as a um, DCMI application profile. Um, then there's the notion of mapping to, to other vocabularies. And um, we have some work in progress, uh, some draft mappings to schema.org, schema also some to Wikidata and to BibFrame. Um, and um, it's, um, it's not uh, entirely clear uh, how we should how we should proceed with this because DC properties are usually more general than what they map to. Um, so if you look on the left, you see an example of DC terms date, and um, there are um, some variants of date um, in schema.org that are narrower, um, but um, um, uh, not uh, that we see um, uh, something that is quite as general as DC date. So perhaps other vocabularies should be mapping to, to DCMI metadata terms. Um, and, but, and we recognize that mappings um, always depend on their intended use. So, um, um, so um, maybe we should be um, looking at uh, new approaches to uh, mapping and uh, maybe we should be working um, uh, more uh, in DCMI. This is not just the usage board, but the usage board is, of course, involved with all of these things, with um, uh, open source uh, programs and tools. Uh, here's an example from a, uh, a presentation by Nicholas Lindstrom yesterday uh, in the BibFrame um, in the BibFrame uh, panel um, about uh, showing. Um, processes they've developed at the National Library of, of Sweden um, to, um, to take, uh, in this case, um, uh, descriptions in BibFrame and express them in, um, in uh, on the one hand, target A is uh, DCMI metadata terms and target B is schema.org. Um, and so um, mappings maybe um, 
uh, depend on the application in which they, um, uh, they will be used. And so um, I think um, I've run out of time and um, um, that was my brief uh, tour of um, what the usage board has done in the past and, um, and some possible new directions for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. That's wonderful to see. You know, the, the actual you know, history and depth of uh, what the usage board has done, how things have evolved over the years. And um, um, anyway, that does bring us to the end of our session. So thank you to everyone who's attended. Thank you to all our speakers, um, especially those of you who've got up very early in the morning uh, to present. Uh, the next session in 10 minutes will be our closing keynote from uh, Carol Palmer from the University of Washington High School, followed by some uh, final remarks from Samo, uh, DC, my executive director. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.